Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. So glad that you are here. In fact, I am so glad that you're here that I have a present for all of you. So uh, it, it's a really big gift. It's a really neat present. You want to see what it is? Yeah. Let's wait. Romans chapter 12 uh, is where we're going to go back to. And so if you've got a Bible with you, uh, if not, if you want a Bible in your lap, reach down there in the seats in front of you and grab one. Or pull out your phone, which is what most of you do. Go to your Bible app and find Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're going to start here and stay here through the remainder of our time together this morning. And I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore. Let's stop there. So anytime we see the word therefore in the Bible, what do we need to do? We need to ask what it's there for. Okay? When you're reading the Bible, anytime you come across the word therefore, you need to ask yourself the question, what is it there for? Because that word is used to indicate a major shift in thinking or, or a major shift in the progression of what's being written. And so if we ask ourselves, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, what is therefore, therefore, we have to go back and look at the entire letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome or to the Christians at Rome. And if we do that and we take a look at all 16 chapters of the letter, we realize that really Romans is divided into two parts. Now, not equally divided, but there are two parts to this letter we call Romans. The first part would be chapters 1 through 11 leading up to chapter 12 where we're starting today. And, and we could title chapters 1 through 11 Foundations of Faith. In the first 11 chapters, Paul speaks about the foundations of our faith. He says that we are all sinners. That we all fall short of God's glory. And because we are all sinners, we are separated from God. Because we fall short of His glory, we are separated from Him. We are estranged from Him in our relationship. But God loves us so much, we've been singing about it all morning long, that He sent Jesus to die on our behalf, to bridge that gap, to bring us out of a strange relationship into a full-blown, life-giving relationship. Before Jesus, there was this thing called the law, and Paul talks about it a lot in the first chapter, first 11 chapters of Romans. And under the law, sacrifices were required. Because people were sinners, they had to bring animal sacrifices to God to make atonement or to make up for their sins. Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice, and so part of the foundations of our faith is that there's nothing we can do to earn God's love. That we can't be good enough, we, we can't make enough good decisions, we, we can't not make enough bad decisions. There's, there's nothing we can do to fix that relationship. And, and the gift that God gives us is love through His Son Jesus, the gift of grace. And Paul tells us that the foundation of our faith is that if we accept that gift of grace, we are brought back into right relationship with God. That's the first 11 chapters, the foundations of faith. See, Paul says, okay, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. In other words, everything I've been talking to you up to this point, everything in the first 11 chapters that I've been speaking to you about, because of those things, I appeal to you, therefore, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So if the first 11 chapters of Romans could be titled The Foundations of Faith, chapters 12 through 16, or the remainder of the letter, could be titled The Responsibilities of Faith. The Responsibilities of Our Faith. So Paul spends the majority of the letter saying, man, this is what God did for us. The gift of grace that's accepted by faith. And now, if you choose to accept this gift, this is the responsibility that you live in. This is where grace takes you. This is where your faith takes you. And he outlines these things in the remainder of his letter to the Romans. It's, 
Him asking us to give our bodies as living sacrifices. Here's what he's saying. Those animal sacrifices I talked about in the first 11 chapters, they no longer cut it. They no longer do it. Now what God wants is you. He wants your body, your mouth, your hands, your feet. He wants you and you become a living sacrifice. That you can't be saved by service but you are saved to service. You don't earn grace by your works, but because of grace, you can't help but be full of works. That's what Paul is saying here. Therefore, I, I, would, I would challenge us this morning to think that if we have accepted the gift of grace, that is freely given to us, that brings us back into right relationship with God, yet do not have a heart to serve. We have to question the acceptance of the gift. Because the gift comes with it, a desire to serve. But here's the hard truth. I've said this three times this morning, and every time I say it, it gets harder. The hard truth is that it's too easy to get consumed by serve us and not service. The, the more we grow in our faith and the more we grow in the grace that God offers to us, the easier it is to fall in the mode of serve us instead of service. But Romans isn't complete just with the foundations of faith. It's only complete with the responsibilities of faith. And here, here's what Paul says. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's what Paul is saying, that God has called you to a responsibility with your faith. He has called you to places to serve. And you don't necessarily just sit around and wait for the light bulb to go off. You offer your body up as a living sacrifice, and in that sacrifice, God will show you exactly where he wants you to serve, where he wants you to be responsible with your faith. I'm afraid far too often we want to sit in another Bible study and wait for the light bulb to go off. We, we desire another Sunday school class and, and wait for the light bulb to go off. Listen, the last thing most of us need is another Bible study. What we need is to put into practice what we've already been learning. We don't need another class on the foundations of faith. We need a class on the responsibilities of faith. And you know what that class is? Get out there and do it. Offer your body up as a living sacrifice. Well, how do I know where to take the first step? How do I know where to start? How do I know how to do this? Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Here's what Paul's saying. Just take some time. Not time to be prideful, but just time to be humble and assess where God has equipped you, where God has gifted you, how God has created you unique how God has given you certain experiences in life that may call you to the places that he's asking you to fulfill your responsibility of the faith. This morning, I want to walk us through this with sober judgment, as Paul says. Using an acronym, it's not unique to me. This, this comes from Rick Warren, who's the pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California. But he uses the acronym SHAPE. S-H-A-P-E. And we can walk through each one of those letters today to help us in sober judgment assess the places that God is wanting us 
to put our bodies as a living sacrifice. S stands for spiritual gift. Spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are God-empowered abilities that are given to us, to believers, for the purpose of bringing glory to God. God-empowered gifts given to believers to bring glory to God. Paul talks about them here in Romans chapter 12. If you keep reading, here's what he says. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is not an exhaustive list of the spiritual gifts. Uh, Paul gives another listing of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Jot that down. You can go back and study that this week. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives a whole other listing of spiritual gifts. I don't believe that even in that listing, all the gifts are exhaustive. But Paul's just giving some examples to the church there at Corinth, just like he is to the church here in Rome. But what we do know from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a couple of things. Let me start with 1 Corinthians 12, 11, which reads this way. All these, he's talking about the spiritual gifts, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Here's a couple of things we learned from 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts. Another thing we learn from Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that each one of us is given a gift or, or gifts. So like if you're sitting there thinking, I, I don't think I got a gift. You didn't miss church that day, I promise you. You got a gift or gifts. The Holy Spirit gives each believer a gift or giftings. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives them. So we don't find the uh, spiritual gift shop and look through the windows and go, ooh, I want that one. That, that's not how it works. We, we can't look at someone else's gift and go, man, I wish I had that gift. Because when we choose to be jealous of someone else's gift or a gift that we don't have, imagine what that does to the Holy Spirit who gives us our gifts. God knew exactly which gift you needed and which gift I needed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, just up a few verses, here's what he says. To each is given, so there we go again. Every one of us have at least one gift. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Here's another thing we learned about the gifts. Is that they are given not for selfish benefit, but for the benefit of everyone else. Not one person can have all the gifts. And it takes all of us to come together and use our gifts for the body to be built up and to be working as it should. We use them to help others out. Because not one of us has all the gifts. Each one of us has a gift, but not all the gifts. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts. And it's our job to discover what gifts we've been given. Well, how do I do that? As we were preparing this message, the team sat down and we were like, man, well, we could give a spiritual inventory test. Even better, we could have people go online and do the spiritual inventory test. And Listen, if you want to do that, there's nothing wrong with that. You can pull up your phone right now and, and you can just Google spiritual gifts inventory and like a hundred of them will pop up. And, and you can take one of those inventories. If you want to take one during the rest of my message, choose the shortest one, please. And you can get, in essence, what some of your giftings may be. But I believe that that's not the best way to discover your spiritual gifts. I believe it's what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. You will know your gifts when you begin to get out there and use what you think may be your gifts. You will know because if you step into an area that you think you may be gifted in and that God wants you to, to serve in and fulfill the responsibility of your faith in, and it doesn't bring you energy and it doesn't bring you excitement you don't see fruit coming from it, it's probably not your gift. But if you step out there and can't wait to do it again, 
and it brings you energy and excitement. And it could be your gift. <coughs> your job is to step into it and figure out where God may be calling you to fulfill the responsibility of your faith. S, spiritual gifts. H, heart. <clears throat> heart, which means your dreams, your desires, your ambitions, the things that you lie awake thinking about at night on a good note, like the things inside of you that just, man, they just rev you up. You can't wait to think about them and to talk about them. Proverbs chapter 27, 19 says this. As in water, face reflects the face. So here's what he's saying. You know what it's like when you, when you look into a stream of water. Obviously not in Lubbock, but you go places where there's streams. And you look into the water, what do you see back? Scary, isn't it? You see your face back. Right? Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face reflects the face, so the heart of man reflects the man. See, the heart, our goals, our dreams, our ambition, it answers the question, where will I serve? My spiritual gift helps me find out what I'm going to be doing. My heart tells me where I'm going to be doing it. It's, my, it's, the, it's the passion I have. It's the thing that, that I'm so excited about. It's it's why our, our mission team that will be leaving here within the next six or seven months to Southeast Asia feels called to Southeast Asia because it's their heart, right? It's why those who serve at our impact campus teach at our impact campus. Teaching is their gift, but their heart is the impact campus. Your heart tells you where you're going to be serving. It, 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 it tells you let me tell you a story that's happened to me recently. So uh, a few years back, uh, God just laid this crazy thing on my mind that we were to uh, become a multiplying church, that, that we weren't to just stay right here, but we were to be start multiplying. And, and one of the first things that, that laid on our hearts was the Impact Campus, and the second thing that was laid on our hearts was uh, this weird thing out at Abernathy with the Methodist Church there. To, to partner with them to bring about a revitalization project. I, I sat down with David Miller, who was the chair of the church council at the time, and I said, man, this is where I think God is calling us to go. And, and David quite honestly said, I, I'm not feeling it. I'm not there with you. And, and that's what the church council does, is they serve as my accountability, right? Tell me when I'm way off base on something. So I said, well, look, just, just pray about it for a week or two, and then we'll, we'll talk about it again. And a week or two, uh, David and I sat down again, and he said, look, I, I think I'm, I'm filling you on this now. I think I understand what, what you're hearing and, and where you want to go. Uh, but David said to me, look, I, I live in Abernathy, but I don't feel called to the church there. Okay, fine, no problem. But you're the chair of the church council, so help lead us in this effort. Two years gone by, incredible things happening with our revitalization partnership out there. This January, David Miller walks into my office, sits on my couch, and says, I'm called to the church in Abernathy. God's changed my heart. This is where me and my family are supposed to be. And so now he's taken some of his spiritual giftings, which is leadership, off the scale, and he's applying it out in Abernathy, which is where his heart is calling him to go. And great and incredible things are happening out there. Our heart will lead us to the places where God has already gifted us to serve. Shape, S, spiritual gifts, H, heart, A, abilities. Abilities. Your abilities are natural talents that you're born with. How do you differentiate between a talent and a spiritual gift? Well, spiritual gifts, remember, are given to believers, those who have received God's gift of grace to bring glory to God. Anyone can have a talent. Not every... I, listen, Jason's not as good at basketball as he says he is, all right? But not everyone <laughs> who's good at basketball uses that gift to glorify God or as a believer for that matter, but they have a natural talent. And there are lots of natural talents in the Bible. Here, I'll just read off a list of these natural abilities to you. Uh, talents listed in the Bible. Artistic ability, architectural ability, administering, baking, boat making, candy making, debating, designing, embalming, embroidering, engraving, farming, fishing, gardening, leading, managing, masonry, making music, making weapons. Needlework, painting, planting, philosophizing, machine ability, inventing, carpentry, sailing, selling, being a soldier, tailoring, teaching, writing literature, and poetry. There, there's somebody, we have a guest with us this morning who has a natural ability to write. 
Uh, she actually happens to be out at our Abernathy campus. Her name is Jill Sinclair. She wrote this book called All You Need is Love because she has a natural ability that's given for writing. She uses that natural ability to bring glory to God, and she did that in this book. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to endorse her book. I'll just read to you what I, what I wrote. In All You Need is Love, Jill Sinclair takes us on a winsome journey from Webster to Shakespeare to the ultimate love story, all the while teaching us how to love God, love ourselves, and love others. It's instructive, yet inspiring and challenging. You can't help but walk away from All You Need is Love with a newfound paradigm on the key to life. All you need is love. Yes, it really is that simple. Jill's with us today. She has a table out in the lobby and I would encourage you to stop by and visit with her. Maybe even purchase a book, get her to sign it this morning. She's just taking a natural talent that God has given her and using it where God is calling her to use it. I'll give you another example. Blake, Amy and I's oldest one. He's 20. He's a freshman at Texas Tech. He's about to finish his first year of college. Blake has the gift of manipulation. <laughs> now, we haven't really decided for sure yet whether it's a spiritual gift or not. But it's definitely a natural ability. He's been doing it his entire life. His degree plan is public relations. Go figure. And so uh, he's been telling us in college that, man, some of these classes are hard. Math is hard. And we get his grades and we go, amen, math is hard for you. But do you know what he excels in? His public relations classes. And he's like, why is that the case? And I'm like, why? Because that's your natural ability. It's what comes easy to you. You've been developing the gift of manipulation your entire life. Now make some money with it. <laughs> Abilities. P, personality. Personality. We all know what personality is, right? The combination of characteristics and qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. Look around the room. We've got a lot of characters in this place this morning, all with unique personalities. Many of you have probably taken personality inventories, and you may look across this room, and you may have the same letter types as someone else, or you may have the same color, or you may have the same animal, or, or you may have the same number, but nobody in this room is identical because God created each of us different with a very unique personality. Some of you in this room are extroverts. You're a strange group of people, and I don't really get you. Like, if there's not a party, you're going to start one. And I'm like, why? Can't we just all hang out in the corner by ourselves? That's much better on everyone, right? Some of you in this room like order. Some of you in this room wouldn't know order if it bit you in the butt, right? Some of you like routine. You go the same way to work every day. You go into a restaurant, you order the same thing every... I, but I'm not critiquing this. I love this, all right? But others of you have to do something different just for the sake of being different, right? Here, why is this such a big deal? Here's why it's such a big deal. Because two people can have the same spiritual gift but use it completely different because of their personality. Two people can have the same gift of evangelism. Now, evangelism is a gift. That doesn't mean those of us who don't have the gift of evangelism aren't called to tell others about Jesus. We are. All of us are given that mandate. But some of us, it comes very easy for. But take an extrovert and an introvert that both have the gift of evangelism. An extrovert will start a party where they tell everybody about Jesus. An introvert is going to write a book that may share the gospel of Jesus Christ with hundreds of people. They're both using their gift, but they're doing it with the personality that God gave to them. The last one, E, experiences. Life experiences. Experiences growing up, both good and bad. Family experiences, educational experiences. Career experiences. Experiences in life that are painful. In fact, I, I think we need to hear this this morning. That experience in your life that you most regret or the experience in your life that you most resent or the experience in your life that you've been trying to hide from may be the experience that God is calling you to use. 
to fulfill the responsibility of your faith. I, I had a, a young lady sitting in my office this week who's gone through a horrendous experience. She wouldn't wish it on anyone else. But she knows that God never wastes anything. And he's given her a passion, a heart, to use her experience to reach others who are going through the same exact thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 is what she's doing. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in the same affliction. And she sat in my office and she said, look, this is the dream that God's given me. This is her heart. She was sharing it with me. I was so privileged to get to hear it. And then she says, but I have no idea where to start or how this is going to look. And I simply said back to her, then God's got you right where he wants you. Because he's going to use an experience that was incredibly painful to help others who are going through the same pain. And you're going to be utterly dependent on him to find out exactly how he's calling you to do it. God may be calling you to do the same. This is how it works. Shape. You are shaped like no one else. And when you use your spiritual gifts and abilities in the area of your heart's desire in a way that reflects your personality and your life experiences, you will find your true calling in life. Your true place in the church. You see, here's the honest truth with the gift. I, I do have a gift for you, but only you know what's in the box. I, I, I can't tell you what your shape is. I can sit down with you as a lot of other people can and try to walk you through your spiritual giftings or your heart or your abilities or your personality or your experience, but I can't do every step of the process for you. You have to discover your shape. You have to discover your gifts. You have to open the gift. You see, here's the sad truth of the matter is that when you receive any gift from anyone, that gift can be worth a whole lot of value. It can be not just money value, it can have very sentimental value. It can be a very valuable gift. But if you choose to take the gift and set it on a shelf and never open it, then you utterly, you say to whoever gave you the gift that it is completely worthless. Because you can only experience that value if you open it. And I'm afraid that many of us are sitting in this room or watching online and we've never opened the gift of our shape. We've never opened the, the, the gift that God's given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We've never wrestled with God about our heart's desire and calling. We've never really sat down and not just blamed everything we don't like to do on our personality, but discovered why God wants to use our personality why God gave us the natural abilities that he did and the life experiences that he did to fulfill the responsibility of our faith. And when we refuse to open the gift, we render it worthless. God says, open the gift. Discover your shape. He says it this way in Romans chapter 14, verse 12 in the responsibilities of faith section that Paul writes about. He says that all of us will be given account of ourself to God. That one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to answer what we did with the gift. Rick Warren says it this way, that, that one day we're going to stand before God and he's going to ask us two questions. Number one, he's going to say, what did you do with the gift of my son Jesus Christ? And number two, he's going to say, what did you do with the gift that I gave you? Paul would say it this way. What did you do with the foundations of faith laid before you? And what did you do with the responsibility of that faith? God, we pray this morning 
for those sitting in this room, those watching live, or those that are going to watch on demand, for the ways that gifts have been opened, personalities are being used, natural abilities are being used, that we're following our heart and tapping into the life experiences that you've given us. God, we give you praise and thanks for the ways you are receiving glory and that your kingdom is being impacted through those that are using their shape. And God, we pray that you continue to do miraculous signs and wonders through those that have opened the gift and are using what you've given them. God, we pray for even more than we can ask or imagine. God, we also pray this morning for the gifts in this room that remain unopened. The ones that are so valuable that the Holy Spirit gave that we've refused to open and have rendered utterly worthless. God, help us to open the gift, to discover our shape, fulfill the responsibility of our faith. God, teach us. It's not about serve us, but about service.